Poetry is one of the ways that we can talk to each other around the world, and sometimes the world is almost in our own homes. Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name is Dean Atta and I'm your chair for this event, Michael Rosen Migration Stories. Um, hello, Michael. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm going to give a brief introduction to you. Michael Rosen is known around the world for his picture books and poetry full of heart and good humour. On the move, poems about migration. Michael weaves his family's personal history in his poetry from his childhood to, as a first generation Polish immigrant in London to the family member who never made it back from the Holocaust. These experiences are brought together with a universal message. You can only do something now. And here is the book we're going to be hearing from. It's beautifully um, got pictures by Quentin Blake, um, which I'll be sure to ask you a bit about those as well. But before we talk about the pictures, it's all about the poetry. Um, so, Michael, you're going to give a reading for us and um, I'll, I'll invite you to take it away, please. Thanks very much, Dean. Thank you. And hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here, wherever here is for you, uh, which is the fun of these Zoom chats, isn't it? Um, so in this book, it's arranged across several sections. Uh, the first section is called Family and Friends. Then it's the war. Then it's the migrants in me. And then it's on the move again. And so there are poems in each one of these sections. And binding them together is the idea that poetry is a migrant as well. So I've called it, I've said, poetry is the migrant. It travels. Poetry is the migrant. It listens. Poetry is the migrant. It lasts. So poetry is one of the ways that we can talk to each other around the world. And sometimes the world is almost in our own homes. So this first poem, uh, it's uh, in a way, it's a little bit like Dean's background, because I know a little bit about Dean, because uh, my mum could speak two languages. She was a very first language that she knew it was a language called Yiddish that um, many Eastern European Jews knew and, and many people still do, uh, particularly, say, in London and Paris and New York, um, a language with a sort of German base to it, but with lots of other bits in it, Polish and, and Hebrew and so on. And um, my mum, that you just got scatterings of it. I think Dean's a bit luckier. I think he can speak Greek. But um, uh, it, it, with me, I, I can't really speak this language, but there's whole chunks of it in my mind. So we'll start with my mum, and it goes like this. Mum can speak two languages and sometimes mixes them up. She doesn't say, don't moan. She says, don't kvetch. She doesn't say, don't slurp your soup. She says, don't hoop. She doesn't say, don't burp. She says, don't graps. And she doesn't say, don't fart. She says, don't fots. And when I get wrinkles in my socks, she says, it looks like I've put my feet through a pile of bagels. So she says, take the bagels out of your socks. Can you imagine that, a pile of bagels in your socks and you put your feet through it, you see? So I sing it all back to her. Don't kvetch, don't hoop, don't graps, don't fots. Take the bagels out of your socks. So see if you can do that, wherever you are at home. Remember those four words, kvetch, hoop, graps and fots. And then it's take the bagels out of your socks. Here we go. One, two, three. Don't kvetch, don't hoop. Don't graps, don't fots. Take the bagels out of your socks. You did it, I bet. There you go. So there we are. So in that section about home and what it was like, then language is ever so important, isn't it? it, it it's vital to us. There may be little expressions, little words and so on. And uh, it's also important that you start grabbing these stories that your mums and dads tell you, whoever's looking after you, your nana, your granddad. Um, in my family, my grandparents on my mother's side, even, there was even another name for them, Bubba and Zayda, that means granny and granddad. And also there were these strange mysteries. So here's one about my dad. My father came to England from another country. My father's mother came to England from another country. But my father's father stayed behind. So my dad had no dad here and I never saw him at all. One day in spring, some things arrived, a few old papers, a few old photos. And oh yes, 
a hulky, bulky, thick-checked jacket that belonged to the man I would have called Grandad, the man who stayed behind. But I kept that jacket and I wore it and I wore it and I wore it till it wore right through at the back. So if any people, some people say, you know, poems, do, are there tips for writing poems? How do you write poems and so on? I'll just reveal a little thing there. We always know about rhythm and rhyme, but of course your other great motor in poems is repetition. So you don't have to say, I really love that jacket or uh, you don't have to sort of play around with lots of adjectives around jackets. Sometimes you can just say it two or three times. I wore it and I wore it and I wore it till it wore right through at the back. So you can use repetition, you can use repetition in order to say what you feel in different ways. And here's another one of these mysteries in the family. If you've got a mystery in your family, it's a great thing to write about. A ship in a bottle sails down the mantelpiece. A ship in a photo brings grandma here. Ships that talk and talk about. Ships far and near. How did the ship get in the bottle? Ships by night and by day. Ships they talk and talk about. Why did grandma come to stay? Who put the ship in the bottle? Ships that they once knew. Ships they talk and talk about. Why didn't granddad come too? When did the ship get in the bottle? Ships sailing far and near. Ships they talk and talk about. Who else didn't come here? Who broke the ship in the bottle? Can anyone tell me why? Ships they talk and talk about. And why did the baby die? So my memories, and maybe this is the same for any of you listening, um, sometimes the memories, they get muddled, don't they? And you're not quite sure which grandma, which granddad I was watching, who do you think you are the other night with, um, with Daniel Ratcliffe? And, um, you know, he knew very little about quite near relatives, you know, great uncles and great aunts. And he was able to piece some of that. And it was, it was really moving, but it was quite interesting how he wasn't quite sure who had done what and which story was attached to who. Great things for writing about. And this one is about my great friend, Robert, uh, and we still talk to each other. And this is when I was a boy. Robert asked me over for tea. My mum would be pleased to see you again, he said because his mum was Mrs. Liebenthal, the school secretary. We sat down to eat, Mr. and Mrs. Liebenthal, Robert and me. Mrs. Liebenthal gave us flat wooden plates and she asked me if I liked rye bread and I said, I think so. And I put it on the wooden plate. She said, did I like Leibkuchen? I said, um, I don't really know. She put a chocolate heart on the wooden plate. She said, did I like Pfeffernusser. And I said, I don't really know. And she put a Pfeffernusser on the wooden plate. The rye bread was okay. The Leibkuchen was the best chocolate biscuit I'd ever tasted, really. The Pfeffernusser, though. Oh, the Pfeffernusser. Oh, wow, they were heaven. Sweet icing, cinnamon cake inside. I had never tasted anything like it. How was that, Michael? Mrs. Liebenthal said. It was really nice, I said. And she seemed so pleased, so very pleased that I said that. And Mr. and Mrs. Liebenthal looked at each other and smiled. So you have these memories of going round to other people's houses and being introduced to foods that are a little bit maybe like yours and then not like yours. So Mr. and Mrs. Liebenthal, they'd come from Germany, whereas my forebears had come from Poland. And so though some of the foods overlapped, some of them didn't. So what I'm expressing there about, well, I think so. I'm not quite sure that's what that's about, yeah? But then sometimes, of course, your friends might surprise you. And sometimes they're pleasant memories and sometimes not so pleasant. My friend Roger says that I can't walk up the road with him in case his parents see me. So I say goodbye to him at the corner of the road. But sometimes I just lean round the edge of the wall on the corner and watch him walk up the road on his own. And I never knew why. I never knew why it was that I wasn't allowed to play with him. I don't know whether it's because we were Jewish. I don't know whether it's because... Um, well, there's this funny word that's a horrible word that people use against other people, which is the word common. 
There it is. It's quite a common word in the sense that we all use it, but people sometimes used to say it about other people. Oh, he's a bit common. And it's a way of looking down at other people. And I don't know, I think maybe whether we were common or Jewish or both, and that was the problem. I don't know. I mean, I'm laughing about it now, but it was a bit of a, a kind of mystery. So again, it's something you can write about if ever you have these feelings. You don't have to show anybody. Some poems you can write just for yourselves. And I think when I first wrote that one, I did. I just wrote it for myself and then it's made its way into a book. So this one is about Oscar and Rachel. So let me just introduce to you the idea that when I was growing up, um, my father in particular said that he had two French uncles and they were there at the beginning of the war and they weren't there at the end. And he used to say this and he used to have a kind of, it's a bit difficult to describe, but his face used to be sort of slightly kind of soft and floppy when he said it. And he had a look on his face that there was nothing you could do about it. I knew it but in connection with other things, but he said it about these, and he knew their names, Oscar and Martin, but he didn't know what had happened to them. And um, that's the way it was for years and years and years, uh, right up until, oh, about 25 years ago, when I started investigating and trying to find out what actually had happened to them. And with a, a combination of luck of some old letters that turned up and me doing a lot of research, I did find out, and it's an awful and terrible story about Oscar and his brother Martin, that Oscar had another name, Yeshi, because some Jewish people, well, most Jewish people have two names, the name from the synagogue and the name in civil life, in, in ordinary life. So he was Oscar and Yeshi. Um, and Martin, who was called Shilmea as well. Um, and I found out about them. I found out that Oscar Yeshi was married to somebody called Rachel, uh, but they were deported. They were deported from France um, to Auschwitz, uh, where they never came back. So we have to uh, assume they were killed. So um, I've written some poems about them in this book because it's not the book's not only about migration, it's also about refugees and persecution. Some migration is lovely and fun and terrific, and it all works out fine. Another migration not, is forced upon people. So Oscar's wife was called Rachel. So this is, you can write poems that are letters. This is a letter. Dear Oscar and Rachel, Oscar and Rachel, you escaped from where they pinned a yellow star on you. You escaped from where they took all you had. You escaped from where they made you put a sign on your market stall saying, Jewish business or in French, entreprise juive. Oscar and Rachel, you heard it was safe in the great resort of Nice on the other side of France because the Italians in Nice were refusing to send Jews like you away on trains to the east to a place no one was coming back from. So you both ran all the way there. Oscar and Rachel in Nice, the Italians put you in the grand old hotel you were waiting in that hotel thinking you were safe, thinking you were about to get on board and sail away across the sea to North Africa, and you would be safe till the war was over. Until you saw the Italians leave, until you saw one of the worst, most violent Nazis of all march into Nice, until his police found a few thousand of you waiting in the hotel and wrote your names down and put you on a train to Paris and then or on a train to the east where no one was coming back from. Oscar and Rachel, you were so close, so near to the waves that will take you away, so near to where the war couldn't reach you. I sometimes think how on holidays in France when I was a boy, I might have met you, Oscar and Rachel, and I would have listened to you telling stories about your great escape across the sea. So I did. I spent a lot of holidays in France and still do. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very kind of important place to me, France. So it's quite odd that I, I grew up and I went to lots of holidays when I was growing up and didn't know anything about Oscar and Rachel. So France has become a slightly different place for me, a place that was dangerous for relatives of mine in that time dur during the war. And this is the other uncle, what happened to him. In the early hours of the 31st of January, 1944, four French policemen knocked on the door of Madame Bobière in the village of saint Hermine in the Vendée. Later, the policeman in charge, 
wrote a report explaining what happened next. Martin Rosen opened the door. He was, the report said, born on the 18th of August, 1890, at Kroznowice in Poland, jeweller, son of Jonas and Rachel, naturalised French Jewish race, 1 metre 62, brown eyes, oval face, straight nose, regular mouth, dressed in yellow cotton trousers and grey cotton jacket wearing a Basque beret and low-heeled shoes, scar on his left cheek. He was taken to the parish hall at La Roche-sur-Yon. What they didn't go on to say was that this was the first step on a journey that would take Martin Rosen first to Drancy, the prison for Jews, and then to a station called Paris Bobigny, where he would be put in a cattle truck and sent to Auschwitz, where he was killed. Though these facts are missing, the writing is very neat. In fact, everything seems to have been done properly. So actually, I have a photocopy, a facsimile, it's called, uh, of that document. And when I look at it, I'm quite, well, I am chilled by it because it looks so ordinary. It just says along the top, Gendarmerie Nationale, which means National Police. And it's a very ordinary police report. But the horror behind it is, well, I'm going to use the word again, horrifying, just to see it, how, how ordinary it was. And then uh, this one, uh, uh, Dean asked me to read. It's about my father's cousin, Michael, because he came out of Poland. And so this is a family story. There was a wedding and we were invited. And when we got there, there was a man who they said was my father's cousin. This is Michael, they said. <laughs> same, as, same name as you. And at one point in the wedding, my aunt took me to one side and said that there was a time during the war when Michael was a boy 16 or 17, no older than you are now, Michael, she said. And his parents said to him that it wasn't going to be safe where they were in Poland. And so my aunt said his parents put him on a train and he never saw them again. Like it always was at that time when people told me things like this, my aunt just shrugged, looked sad and said, I suppose they died in the camps. And I never knew what that meant. What were these camps? Why were people taken there? At the wedding, I watched him. He must have been about 40 years old then. In my mind, I thought of him being the same age as me. And I imagined my parents saying to me one day, Michael, go, don't stay. There are soldiers and police said they're kicking us out of our houses and flats. Go, don't stay. So they come with me to a station and we wait for a train. And all the time we're looking out for soldiers and police but it's okay. So they hug me and kiss me and I get on the train and stand in the corridor and wave to them through the window. And I can see them close together, waving. And then there's a shout and a whistle and the train starts to pull off and they wave and they wave and I wave and I wave till they're gone. And that's the last I ever see of them. I never see them again. But wherever I go and whoever I'm with, I remember that picture of them standing together, waving me off. And for the rest of my life, I can't make any of it make sense that they did that thing of making me safe and there was nothing they could do for themselves. And I think again and again of what they might have been thinking at that moment as they waved and stood close to each other. What did they think as they lost everything? And later, they were herded together and taken to a camp, never knowing what had happened, never knowing why this was happening, never knowing what happened to me, even at the very end, as they were closing their eyes. And though I smile and walk about in the world, I carry this with me wherever I am, whoever I'm with. And no matter how many times I try to change it, no matter how many times I try to get them to come with me on the train, or how many times I get them to escape and find me in those freezing places where I ended up, or how many times I imagine that I meet them after the war is over, we hug and kiss and cry, it never happens. It never happens. There is always nothing, nothing but nothing. But I walk about in the world, smiling and nodding. I even go to weddings and people smile at me, <laughs> even this young man, 
with the same name as me, no older than I was then, when my parents put me on the train. And he's looking at me like he's trying to read me like a book. So there's one about Cousin Michael. Michael, that is such a powerful poem. Um, I, I really, yeah, I really want you to, you to read that one because I think the, the, the journey that one poem takes is just phenomenal. Um, and we've actually had a question that's come in that kind of relates to this poem. Um, and it'd be great to have more readings in a bit, but let's have a few questions now. Is that okay, yeah? Absolutely, yeah, um, you run it, yeah. So the, the question is, how do you get inside the heads of your characters and are, are, some, are there some that you kind of get into more than, than others? And I felt like that was one character you really got in the head of Cousin Michael. And you do it in this technique of like imagining you were him. Like, um, how was it to write that? What was your kind of process with writing that particular poem? And if there's any others that were kind of interesting to talk about getting into the heads of your characters? Yeah, well, there's a lovely posh word. It's called interiority. So you can pull that word apart. You know about interiors. We have interiors in houses and we have the interior in our brain. So you turn that into a thing and you call it interiority. So you can hold that in your head and think, well, how do you explore interiority? And of course, it, you know, if you want to use the idea of our heads being like rooms, you've got to get into the room of somebody else's head. You've got to get into their room. If you're writing a story, uh, you know, if you think of any story, then you have a point of view and you can have the point of view of the storyteller. But then again, of the, some of the characters or maybe just one character, that's up to you how you tell the story. So in that story, I did start outside the room because I could see Michael and see him at that wedding, see him on the occasions I've seen him since. Um, he died not long ago, age 97. Um, and... Uh, I just think and think about that idea of saying goodbye to somebody at the station and not seeing them again. And in fact, I know that he had one photograph of his mother. I don't think he ever had a photograph of his father, but I'm not quite sure because he ran away to the other side of Poland and then he was in a work camp and then he was in an army and then he ended up in England. But he had one photograph of his mother. That is, until incredibly... So this helps with how you get into people's heads. Um, so another cousin on the other side of the family in America, he died aged 103. And my second cousin went into the room where I had sat many times asking that old chap, Ted, Ted Rosen, all sorts of stories and family stories. And there was a locked cupboard, or as you'd say in America, a locked closet. And so my second cousin went over and he unlocked it opened it and in it was a box marked family photos and he opened it up and inside were the photographs of all the relatives that I'd been writing about and trying to find out about for 20 years or more that were a complete mystery and they'd been hiding in this locked closet, locked cupboard and one of them was of Michael walking down the street in a place in western Poland that those days was called Bielitz and was now called Bielski Biala and he's walking down the road with his arm in arm with his mother and his mother's sister and I can just see they're so happy and they're in this street and you can see big high apartment buildings on the side of the road and it helped me think about Michael some more mm. and some letters have survived as well written by Michael's mum and dad when he was in the work camp. And so with all that, that all helps you to get inside people's heads. Yeah. So you can use all those things and you can also use your the conversations that you've remembered. Mm. And you can also do this thing that we all like doing, which is to wonder and daydream and think, well, I wonder what why they thought that. I wonder. And once you do that sort of thing, then you're getting into people's heads. So you can use that in your writing. And of course, you're writing about real people, your your family members. Um, how was that? Was there a responsibility there? Um, when, when you didn't know and you had to wonder, did you feel like it was OK to maybe make things up, embellish or just take it in a direction that you weren't sure if this is exactly what happened, but probably was? You know, how did you go about that and how did it feel to do that? 
yes. In fact, it's it's quite odd. In this in this case, what I can do is look back at poems where I didn't know, mm-hmm. and then look at poems where I knew a bit more, and I'm still finding out more. So that that chap Martin, I only found out this week that he was injured. He enlisted for the First World War. I found out two things. One, that he volunteered to fight in the First World War for France. Mm. And then I found out that he was injured in 1915 because they found his war record. When I say they, it's the man who's the mayor of the village where he was arrested. And he's researching more and more because they want to name the local park after him. Mm. So it's going to be Le Parc Martin Rosen, which is going to be incredible, and we're going to go and see it opened and inaugurated in uh, next year, in on May the 8th. So that's already happening. And my friend, my old friend Francois in France, he looked up a bit more. So it's even more that stuff coming now. So I look back and go, oh, you didn't know that when you wrote that. So, you know, I thought that Martin was a dentist. It now turns out he was a jeweller though I've also found out that some jewellers also put gold in people's teeth. So maybe yeah. that's why the family said he was a dentist. <laughs> so I always knew he was a dentist. That means he was a dentist or he was a médecin. He was a doctor, but in actual fact, it turned out it was a bijoutier. But maybe he was both. So, you know, you have these little mysteries and words like jeweller, dentist, they don't sound very poetic, do they? But when you actually sort of see them and you start thinking about what does a dentist do? You know, what do jewellers do? And you think of them pouring over and you think of people coming in who they met. And then after the war, they weren't there. Mm. So suddenly dentist becomes a sort of powerful poetry word because it was so intimate. He was, or a jeweller, he was looking at close things and saying, Madame, voici une bague très jolie, here's a beautiful ring. Something like that, handing it to someone. And then he was gone. So suddenly... Jeweler, you know, means important things. So yeah. sometimes when you find these things, very ordinary words suddenly start meaning stuff. Well, you pay close attention to the meaning of words, of course, and, and you also introduce the reader to words they might not know. And you, you do a lovely thing where you put an asterisk and you, you give us a definition, um, but you only do it the first time. And then afterwards, the word is used kind of really um, fluidly. And so, you know, because we've been taught it, so now here it is again, and we know what it means. And you feel like, as you read this book, you're kind of gathering more and more words and, and kind of being privileged with more knowledge. Um, how was that process to decide what to give um, glossary definitions for and and when to, did the order of the poems change because of that process? Or do you just, whenever there was a new word, you just kind of put that glossary in there for us. Yes, I, I talked about this with my dad because my dad sitting behind me is a book he wrote about his childhood. And of course, his childhood was full of all this language and he wanted to put it, that's Yiddish, wanted to put Yiddish in, in his story, wanted to put his bubba calling him a uh, Meshuggana, that means a crazy boy, a crazy man. And he wanted to put things like that. And in one of my poems in the book, my dad's cooking us this dish. It's like a sort of, it's a bit like an omelette, but he's saying that it tastes best in chicken fat. It sounds, doesn't sound very nice the way I've said it, but anyway, so there's a special word for that, Hina schmaltz. And so my dad would say, it tastes best with Hina schmaltz. So I do put, I just a little asterisk and say what that is. But if schmaltz crops up somewhere else, I think, oh, well, maybe people have put it together and remember. But my dad had the same problem with his book. And what he did was he, he'd have the word in Yiddish and then he would sometimes mostly put the word in English after it as if the person speaking or saying it had said it in both languages. Mm-hmm. But we talked about whether that was a bit awkward or not and whether you need a glossary. So, you know, when you write bilingually, I don't know how you're coping with it, Dean. It's a, an interesting problem that you want to be the word we use is authentic. That's to say you want to make things sound like they are. Mm -hmm. And I always say to children in schools, I always say, if your mum or dad speaks to you with two languages at the same time, and they don't say, don't be a naughty boy or don't be, don't be silly, but they use a word not in English Mm -hmm. well, put it down. It doesn't matter if you can't write it in the letters that it is. Let's say you, your parents speak Punjabi and you don't know Punjabi lettering. Well, put it down just how it sounds Mm -hmm. and then do the asterisk thing and then you can be authentic. And uh, I can see it's, it's kind of frees you because you don't, because if, if let's say it's don't be silly, silly might sound a bit odd. But if your dad said, you know, the boy's my sugar, as my dad would say, the boy's crazy, my sugar. Or he didn't say, don't be a clever clog. So you'd say, ha, huh, don't be a knucker. Well, you know, when I hear knucker, that sounds so much like my dad, a k- k- <laughs> 
you know, whereas clever clogs, it's got a cur in it, but he, he never said that. Mm. So if I wrote, Michael, don't be a clever clogs, and I'm being my dad, I'd think, well, he never actually said that, so it feels like a cheat, mm. you see? Um, I'm, I'm wondering how the younger members of the family are engaging with this work in particular. Um, um, yes, they, 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 some of them are, are quite intrigued. Just occasionally I do hear one or two of them coming back with, with one of them, but um, mm -hmm. I think it's the sad tapering off. You know, you start with, say, my mum's mother and father speaking Yiddish all the time sort of thing. You come to my mum, who probably didn't speak it much after the age of five, though she knew lots. Um, and then you come to me with bits and bobs and little kind of almost as if I've collected a rag bag from my mum and dad and all the different words they use and how they tell each other off for using swear words in that language. You know, my dad would mutter something and mum would say, don't say that. <laughs> and we'd say, what did he say? And she'd say, don't tell him, don't tell him, Harold, you see. And so we'd go, what, 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 what was that word? You know, you want to know the rude words that your mum and dad say, don't you? And um and so I've got all this. And then what's quite funny when I watch American movies or I watch Jewish comedians or uh, people, you know, older ones like Mel Brooks and so on talking on the telly or Larry David. And I, and I think, oh, I know that. Yeah, I know what he's saying there. Mm -hmm. So it is quite funny. You get that recognition thing, you know. Yeah. Um, I've got a question here that's, that's being voted up by popularity. So people are asking, um, has your book come out in other countries or any of your other books as well? And how does it feel um, seeing and hearing your poems in in different languages and does it does a translation bring out new meanings or change anything for you yes as you might expect we're going on a bear hunt is the one that's been translated the most i i can say it in french la chasse à l'ours i can say it in german i think it's wir gehen auf ein bernjacht i think or is it einem i'm not very good with my word endings um, and it's come out in uh, Spanish, I know, which is something like uh, vamos, uh, vamos, ah, no, I'm not going to remember it. There you go. My Spanish is hopeless anyway. And then the Italian, something like la caccia del, or de la, del orso, something like that, or del orso, is it? Anyway, or, no, it must be with an R, uh, otherwise that would be a bone. My Latin tells me that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's come out in a lot of languages. And then um, the book that I did that went with this, mm. the On the Move, I did a book called The Missing, which tells the story about how I found out about my relatives. Mm -hmm. And that's just come out in Portuguese. Wonderful. So I, I would very much like it to have come out in French and German and other European languages. But at the moment, the only one that's come out in is Portuguese, which I really don't speak, not even anything, <laughs> not a single word. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's wonderful. And occasionally, if they're my poems... Mm. Um, and stories. So um, I've been discovered in Italy, which is lovely. So they've translated some of my uh, little stories I've done, like Fluff the Farting Fish, um, <laughs> has come out in Italian, and also in Turkish. Mm. So uh, that's lovely. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it is. It's fantastic. But particularly for the one language I do speak, which is French, because yeah. I can sort of read it and think, oh, isn't that clever? Look how they found a way of doing that. So I did a book a long time ago called You Can't Catch Me, and that came out in French as Essai de m'attraper, uh, Try to Catch Me. Uh, you Can't Catch Me, if you can translate it literally. And um, it was lovely because there's sort of all sorts of bits in it that I could think, oh, that was really clever to do that. So, yeah, it's a thrill. If it comes out in another language, yes. And, of course, this, this book is like, for me, it reads like a jigsaw puzzle because you're piecing together... Um, you know, your family history, and then also putting it into the wider, bigger picture. Um, and I think it would be nice for people to maybe hear some of the poems that talk about the kind of wider issues of migration um, towards the end of the book. Is there a, one or two that you'd like to read? Yeah, let's do Overheard in a Classroom. And um, yes, this has come out in Italian, in fact. I think it's called Il Camino. I think that's what it's called. Il Caminino. Anyway, if, you're, if you speak Italian, please don't be cross with me. But that's, that's what it's called. I, I could go over to the shelf and find it. <laughs> this is Overheard in a Classroom. He doesn't speak English, miss. He comes from the Congo, miss. I translate for you, miss. He says that the bad men take his grandfather, miss. He says that the bad men take his grandmother, miss. He says that the bad men take his dad, miss. He says that the bad men take his mum, miss. He doesn't say how he got here, miss. He can't say how he got here, miss. 
So sometimes you can write and it's almost what we call verbatim. That means yeah. that you're almost writing down what you've just heard. Mm. So I was sitting in a classroom in Hackney and there, was the, there were these two boys together and one boy was translating for the other and, um, and he was then explaining it to the teacher and I was sitting there because I was helping him with poems and he was getting puzzled. Um, and so I was sort of in on a kind of triangle. Mm -hmm. And then there was this story that came out and then I went away and wrote it down. And, and how did you feel? Like, was that a, a responsibility you felt to tell a bit of his story? Because um, we've got a question also that's come in that asks, um, how do you think migrants in the current migrant crisis around the world can get their voices heard? Um, yes, well, I, it's a variety of ways. I mean, one way is if poets and writers take on the responsibility of writing about them, but then we do have this problem about whether you, the word, the, the word that's used is appropriate, whether you, as it were, steal other people's experiences and somehow other benefit from them so you have to be very careful about that mm -hmm. and the best thing is if you can find ways to give people the voice in other words make a space mm -hmm. so I'm not a powerful person but some people might think that I am because I'm on the radio or I publish books and so if this stuff matters to you then you have a responsibility to publicize migrant writers or sometimes share a platform if that draws attention to them so I've done shows where uh, people have worked with refugee writers um, and have asked me along and I've had a little spot there and if that's a help then in fact I can I'd like to do more but I did one I remember uh, near the National Theatre the, in the little street behind the National Theatre it was amazing there was one writer after another who was working in a group a group of refugee migrant writers and what they said, you know, it was so powerful and such a moving occasion. I think I just read a couple of poems, but there was, you know, it was a, it was organised by a guy called Max Reinhardt, I remember. And, um, you know, ideally, if people want, if are working with migrant groups, if they set up ways for people to write and to give, just give a space and a voice to it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the best way. I mean, we're best when we're writing about ourselves, but of course, sometimes... We can be the vo be the the channel mm. to express, and so I've tried to be authentic to what that those boys were saying to each other. Yeah, and that and sort of this book, you, you start with yourself, don't you? So I think that's the great journey of this book is starting with yourself, your family experiences, and then widening it out to other other migrant experiences as well. Um, we've got a big question here that asks, what's um, the most important thing we can all be doing at the moment to tackle issues like the migrant crisis and the climate crisis, which is, of course, going to have um, effects of migration as well in the long it term. Is. Yeah. Um, you're probably asking the wrong person, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you imagine that each of us kind of develops an area of what we call expertise, that's mm -hmm. the thing that you're you feel most confident with and that you want to do. Mm. So um, to steal a picture from a, the great poet Seamus Heaney, he once described the image of his dad digging, mm -hmm. digging the turf, that's to say the peat in Ireland. And he described that and then he finishes the poem by saying that sometimes he thinks his nib of his pen is a little bit like his dad's spade going into the turf. Mm. So you're digging words. Mm -hmm. And so that's his poem, if you want to see it. Uh, I've forgotten what it's called now. People will remember better than me. Um, and uh, that's sort of my job. So I'm not some, I mean, I listen to people talking about climate change. I listen to people talking about migration and so on. And I kind of offer support to various people. So I think coming from where I do is I offer support where I believe and agree with what they're saying rather than being a spokesperson for those things. So I'll slightly duck that question and retreat behind my <laughs> curtain of words, if I may. Totally okay. fine. Of yes. course, of yeah. course. Um, I, I did want to ask, though, another question that's come in about your work and being political. Do you feel your work is political and has it got it more so? Um, and, and what is that kind of relationship between poetry and politics for you? Well, in a way, you know, it's, it's very glib and easy to say all poetry is political. I mean, if I write about mum and dad or my bedroom, mm. well, that's political because not everybody in the world's got a bedroom. 
as a child. So, you know, I, if I write a poem begins, I share my bedroom with my brother and I don't like it. Well, you know, you, the, we've got a gag, haven't we? First world problem. You know, if, yeah, you know, you share a bedroom with your brother. You should be so lucky. You know, we all sleep in the same room. I could imagine somebody saying in another country in another time, mm-hmm. or the fact that I, if I say my mum and dad, well, I was brought up by my mum and dad, but what if your dad had to migrate in order to work, in order to support the family? Well, then you haven't got a dad bringing you up. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it might be the mum who's migrated, whatever, however it is. So even just a very simple thing, uh, or the fact that your brother, has, your older brother has survived. You know, there are millions of people all over the world that their older brother or sister hasn't survived for whatever reasons, war or, or starvation and so on. So in a way, everything is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I found a way of looking at that. You take a, a lovely story like Where the Wild Things Are, you might say, mm-hmm. well, there's nothing political about that, but there's a boy on his own with a bedroom, but he's got a single mum by the looks of it. There's no dad in the story. Mm-hmm. So already you're making a statement about what kind of home he comes from. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he's got this space that he goes away with as a boat all on his own. So he's got a, a mind space where he can imagine himself like that. So all these things. And then we have another meaning of the word politics, obviously, which is all these things that we're talking about, climate, refugee, migrants. And then we have yet another meaning of the word about political parties, mm-hmm. which in a sense is the sort of the least important bit, I always think. But anyway, <laughs> I might say that. Um, so, yes, in a way, I think it all is if you piece it together. And sometimes it's what we call explicit. In other words, it's obvious. And other times it's kind of in the background. But that's what we call assumptions or maybe our cultural bias or unconscious bias, we call it, where we don't even know. Mm. You know, that somebody like me, when I was growing up, I probably didn't know I was white, mm. right? Yeah. Why would I know? I knew I was Jewish, but I didn't know that there was this thing called whiteness mm-hmm. that, is, that now that we learn. So we learn about colour, ethnicity, uh, culture. We learn about all these things and what, is, what matters, what doesn't matter, and where these things have happened in the past. Mm. So... In a way, I've learned all that yes. through life. So, and I'm still learning. You know, boy, you know, boy, <laughs> am I still learning. So, in this moment, Michael, what is mattering to you, and what are you working on, like in your writing or in your life, that feels like it really matters? Uh, well, I'm working on several things. I've got a book for the very, very, very youngest, meant for babies, a book of poems for babies, mm. because again, you know, that if, if you think, well, that can't be political. How can that be political? Well, it is because some people think that you should only do one kind of language stuff with children. It's called phonics, and other people think you shouldn't. So I'm with the anyway. Won't go there, but anyway, the point is. So I've written a book of poems for the youngest, um, coinciding with the fact that I do have a granddaughter. So that's quite nice sort of thinking about sort of having a very, you know, someone in the family who's very young sort of thing. So I've been doing that. Uh, I've also been uh, correcting a story that's about Michael uh, in a way. I've got a cousin in London who's writing to this cousin in Poland and it's a book of letters, so it's going to be a story that is of letters, imagined, all imagined, and that's I'm just correcting that one at the moment as well. What age group is that one for? That'll be for sort of eight nines upwards, because it's two cousins who've met in London, and then he doesn't know what's happened to his cousin abroad, so so that's that's on the way. And then there's also a book about how I used my stick to learn how to walk because I've been ill and I was so ill, I couldn't stand up. Yeah. So I couldn't stand up and I couldn't walk. Mm. So I had to, to uh, be taught how to do it. So this was 14 months ago. Mm. I was in a rehabilitation hospital and they taught me how to stand up. And I had a stick and I called my stick Sticky McStick Stick. It's not, <laughs> it's not very inventive, it, but anyway, some people thought it was funny. You did, Dean. Yeah. Um, so... Um, and my publishers thought it was funny. So I've written a story about me and Sticky McStick Stick and learning how to walk. And that's, that's coming of out. course, after having had COVID, isn't it? And, and being in intensive care. How are you now? I'm sure everyone would want to know how you're doing, how you're feeling now. Um, well, some of the things are permanent. So I can't really see with that left eye. You can see it's red, but that's because of the stuff I put in it. Mm. Uh, I can't really hear with that left ear. 
No, the earphones, it's very nice. I should walk around with these earphones all day. I get a bit dizzy and I have numb toes. Now, there we are. There's an exciting thing. Mm. I have numb toes. So I wiggle my toes about to try and get some sensation in them. Uh, I'll, write, I'll write a poem about my numb toes, I think. <laughs> uh, oh, my toes are numb, my toes are numb. It, you know, it's, it's a bit uh, Winnie the Pooh, isn't it? Tiddly pom. But never mind, it might come out like that. I know, I know what rhymes with numb. Yeah, 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 it's going to come out, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway. We'll um, be looking forward to that one. <laughs> yeah, so I got numb toes, but uh, um, yeah, I, I work on it every day. I have to work on it. Um, so I lift up weights and things like that to try and get strong. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, um, we're wishing you um, even more recovery and strength to come. Um, is there a poem you'd like to close on? Is there a yeah? Let's let's finish with this one. It's called "On the Move Again." It's where the title comes from, and it's a bit sort of a bit more rhythmic and rhymy than some of the other poems in here. So it's called "On the Move Again." You know you've got to go. No time to grieve. You've just got to leave. Get away from the pain. On the move again. Take the train, catch a plane, make the trip in a ship, take a hike, ride a bike, go by car, going far. Use your feet on the street, get stuck in a truck. Then you arrive and you're alive. You arrive, you're alive. What you leave behind won't leave your mind. But home is where you find it. 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 Oh, thank you, Michael. You really are the master of repetition. <laughs> <laughs> you do that so well. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you to everyone who asked such excellent questions. Um, this book is available as signed copies on the online bookstore. And if you're on site at the Edinburgh College of Art, there are signed copies in the bookshop there as well. Um, so one more time, Michael Rosen, thank you with all my heart for, for being so generous with what you shared and for the wonderful work that you do in your poetry and outside of your poetry. Um, you're a real inspiration to me and so many. And um, yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone for watching. Have a thank you. Thanks day. ever so much. Thank you, Dean. Lovely. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for coming.